Thank you, Fernando. Uh, good morning, good good afternoon, or good evening to um, to everyone. Um, I would like first to thank you for uh, proposing us to present here uh, the trends in PV application, which is uh, the main annual publication of the IEA PVPS um, research program. Uh, I will start with a presentation during 20 minutes about the trends in PV market applications. And um, Izumika Izuka will follow after me with uh, more information about technology and industry development. Uh, I will not say too many things about the IEA PVPS. You can find more information about, on the, about IEA PVPS on uh, its website. But basically, it's one of uh, what was called implementing agreement from the International Energy Agency. So basically, a research program that focuses since 1993 on PV development. It comprises almost all important PV markets that have popped up in the last years from an industry or from a market point of view. Before starting to discuss about PV, I think it's interesting to remind why um, the development of renewables and the development of PV in particular is so important. Uh, when we're discussing about climate change mitigation, uh, most scenarios at the horizon 2050 and the one that you can see on the slides are basically showing that if you want to keep the temperature uh, within 2 degrees Celsius, and this is not uh, anymore the target that has, been, uh, that has been defined at COP21, it's now 1.5 degrees, uh, even for 2 degrees we need to develop renewables much more than the levels that have been reached now. And in the most optimistic scenario from the International Energy Agency, PV should represent 16% of the electricity demand in 2050 in the world. If we look at all solar electricity production technologies, so PV and CSP together, then we are reaching 30%. So we will, um, I will discuss in the coming minutes about the evolution of the market, but we have to keep in mind that this is just the start of something that is expected by many to become much, much bigger in the coming years and decades. But b before saying that it becomes bigger, we have to look at where we are coming from. And um, in general, I'm saying in, that in the world of energy, 10 years are an ex ex extremely short period of time. And if we are looking just 10 years in the past, in 2005, the, the PV market was extremely small, around 2 gigawatts. And what we can see in 2014, which are the latest numbers that have been um, collect it officially with, I would say, a high level of uh, accuracy, we reach 40 gigawatts. So a market has been multiplied by at least 20 um, in only nine years. And we expect that in 2015 um, that the market could have reached more than 50 gigawatts, 51 gigawatts. Um, these are numbers that have been just collected um, by um, by uh, research analysts. What is extremely interesting, if we're looking at the evolution of the PV market, is that we can see that it grows by phases. In general, we have one growth phase followed by uh, one, sometimes two years of delay. And if we look at uh, the, the very first year where the PV market started to, uh, to boom, it was 2008, thanks to uh, rapid PV development in Spain. And then 2009 was a year of limited growth. And then again, we saw in 2010 and again in 2011 a remarkable growth of the market. And that growth stopped in 2012. And, in, and again after that, in 2013, the market grew again and it stabilized in 2014. And in 2015, the market started to grow again. And what we, what we can see from this market evolution is that basically it takes a certain number of years to the global PV market to digest the very fast growth that in general is coming from a limited number of countries where the regulatory framework that has been defined in order to, um, to support PV development, then this regulatory framework um, takes a certain number of years to be established, and then the digestion of the evolution of the PV market takes, in general, one year. That's what we have seen in 2012. That's what we have seen in 2014. But for the first time, and I will uh, say a few words about PV development in the future, 
uh, we can see that PV is starting to develop in many, many different places around the world. So we might see in the coming years a certain number of years of um, PV growth. If we're looking at the total installed capacity, this is extremely interesting. Uh, at the end of 2014, we had 177,000 megawatts or 177 gigawatts of PV system installed all, of, all over the world. Again, the comparison with uh, the numbers 10 years ago are extremely interesting. We had less than 5 gigawatts installed in 2004-2005. So we can see that in the last decade, the development of PV was extremely fast. But it will have to be even faster to reach um, the, the um, I would say, the targets um, that are necessary to fight climate change uh, at the horizon of 2050. Again, if we are looking at 2015, uh, we can see that basically we have most probably now uh, 230 um, gigawatts of PV installed all over the world. What is interesting as well is uh, the fact that um, in the beginning of the development of PV, Europe, Japan, and to a certain extent US contribute, contributed to almost 99% of the market. Then, and that's what we saw with the development of the market in Germany and then in Spain, uh, uh, in Italy, and in other countries, it was the European PV market that drove the growth until roughly 2011. 2011 was the moment where um, Europe installed in only one year 23 gigawatts. 23 gigawatts, it was almost 80% of the global PV market. But since then, uh, the PV market has moved mainly to Asia. And uh, if we are looking at the preliminary numbers for 2015, 30, 30 gigawatts out of 50 or 51 were most probably installed in Asia. And this is something extremely interesting because the, the PV market develops in the Americas, it starts to develop in Africa, it starts to develop in the Middle East, but that's the most populated region of the world, Asia, that is logically now driving uh, the evolution of the PV market. And the pioneers, and especially European markets, are representing only a small fraction of uh, the global PV market. So what we we can derive from uh, this trend is just the fact that PV is coming truly global um, and it starts to follow the demand of electricity um, in um, a certain number of major countries, not only in countries that had the political willingness to start developing it when it was extremely costly in the beginning, so namely European countries and especially Germany. If we look at 2000, 2014, which are the latest uh, accurate numbers that we have for the time being, we can see that the first market in the world was China, followed by Japan and the US. And then only we see a certain number of European countries appearing. I will come back on that in the next slide. Because if we are looking at the top 10 in terms of annual installed capacity in 2014, indeed, that's what I was mentioning about the globalization of the market. We have China that was, without any doubt, the first market in, 2000, uh, in 2014, followed by Japan, very close, the USA, and then three European countries, the UK, where the market boomed in 2014 and even more in 2015, Germany, where the market used to boom, we saw markets uh, higher than 7 gigawatts in Germany three years in a row. And then uh, the market started to decline for various reasons that uh, are a bit too long to explain here. And then we have um, countries where either we have uh, an interesting set of regulations supporting PV development or an interesting set of PV, um, uh, of PV development regulations and a good irradiation. And so we can count on Australia, that installed close to one gigawatt in 2014, Korea, South Africa, and the most surprising one, given the size of the country and uh, its appetite for electricity, it's the 10th place of India. But this was in 2014, and things are changing, and I will just give you a glimpse of what happened in 2015. China will be without any doubt still the number one country, followed by Japan and the US. After that, we can see that the UK market has 
grown significantly. It has boomed in 2015. Final numbers are not known yet, but we can see that, they, that with a reasonable level of accuracy that UK will most probably have installed more than 4 gigawatts in 2015. And then, uh, and I will not talk about all of these markets, but India is growing very fast. And I have no doubt that in the coming years, we will see India coming, uh, if not in the top three, without any doubt in the top five um, countries. Um, you must probably know that India has announced a 100 gigawatt solar plan until 2022, 20, uh, which is only in six years from now, which means that if uh, India wants to keep its extremely high um, installation targets, it has to develop its market very fast. And that's most probably what is uh, ongoing at the present time. We are in the first quarter of 2016, and um, medias and uh, market uh, experts are indeed announcing that the PV market in India is booming. When we are looking at the top 10 countries for the cumulative installed capacity, we had Germany that was uh, either the first or the second uh, market in terms of PV installation during years before the, the growth of the PV ma ma market in Asia. And in 2014, Germany was still the first market, the, the first market with 38 gigawatts installed. Um, at the end of 2015, and that's not a scoop, uh, a scoop China will have taken that position. But uh, it shows that basically a long-term commitment to develop PV uh, was extremely successful in Germany. It was not a boom of one or two years, but it was during the last 10 years or even more a continuous policy support that allowed Germany to reach that level. What is also extremely interesting is that some countries where the market is now extremely small are still um, in the top 10 of uh, cumulative installed capacity. Italy, where the market has almost completely disappeared, in 2014, only 400 megawatts were installed in a country where PV is virtually competitive. But also Spain, that boomed during one year in 2008, and then the market was killed uh, by local policymakers. Now, what is extremely interesting is that Spain is most probably going to go out of the top 10, if not in 2015, for sure in 2016. And then we have a very small country, which is my country of origin, um, Belgium, with a 3 gigawatt market, um, well, 3 gigawatt of total installed capacity. And again, this happened in a, in a few years, but now the market is almost completely dead. We are installing less than 100 megawatt a year. But this is the proof that with the right policy support, it's possible to develop PV very fast in a country. Now, that's what I was mentioning and the fact that uh, the, the order is going to be completely reshuffled and we will see India appearing without any doubt in the top 10 uh, of, total install, of total cumulative capacity uh, for PV installations very fast. Now, I would like to uh, say just a few words about um, the two different kind of PV systems that uh, we have in the world and things that we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't mix, and especially we have indeed one technology, but it can even be discussed when we are talking about everything that relates to BOS, including the inverters. But basically, we have two kinds of PV system. We have PV system for prosumers, what we're calling distributed PV on one side. And basically, we are talking here about self-consumption or self-generation of electricity. We're talking about something that is quite similar to energy efficiency. Uh, if I'm producing my own electricity, basically I will buy less electricity from the grid. Uh, we are talking about the concept of grid parity, which is the moment at which my PV production becomes competitive with the electricity I can buy from the grid, which is not especially the moment where PV becomes really competitive. And we are talking about competi competition with the distribution business of conventional utilities. And then on the other side, we can discuss about producers, so PV use for centralized application, what we are calling in general utility scale or ground mounted applications. Uh, it means that in general there is no local consumption of electricity, so that electricity has to be injected into the grid. 
and it comes in direct competition with the generation business of utilities. And it's extremely important to make a distinction between prosumers and producers because the regulatory challenges are completely different. And to a certain extent, we might see in the coming years technology slightly different appearing even for PV models uh, for large scale PV uh, installations for pure producers and for uh, distributed PV installations for prosumers. And if we're looking at which is the market share of grid-connected centralized PV and grid-connected distributed or de decentralized, what we can see is that we saw a major evolution in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, a very large part of the market was distributed. And we still had a very small part of off-grid installations that, are, uh, that can be considered in most cases distributed. But since then, the share of grid-connected centralized application has increased. And in 2013, 2014, and I have no doubt that this trend is going to continue in the future, a bit more than 50% of all PV installations uh, have been and will continue to be centralized. And the main reason is that it's extremely simple in a country where you have absolutely no regulation for um, renewable energy to start developing large-scale PV. You just have to define PPAs or feed-in tariffs or any kind of very simple remuneration, and it's easier than putting it in place uh, legislation for self-consumption and distributed PV installations. And that's the reason why these centralized PV applications, utility-scale applications, are developing so fast, and why in many emerging countries, what we have seen in uh, 2015, in just to say something, in the Philippines, in Pakistan, in Guatemala, um, in Uruguay, in many other countries, um, and of course the very iconic cases that everyone is discussing for the time being uh, in Dubai or Jordan, where we have extremely low um, uh, electricity prices for uh, such applications. Basically, these utility scale PV applications are developing faster because they are easier to put in place from a regulatory point of view. And something extremely interesting is if we're looking at the, the incentives in 2014 that allowed the market to develop, basically we still have the financial support schemes that are driving the PV market all over the world. Of course, these financial support schemes are less costly than what they used to do when PV developed in Spain or in Germany uh, six, seven years ago. They are now extremely small, extremely close to competitiveness in a certain number of countries, but they are still driving the PV market. Fee and tariff represented in 2014 more than 60% of installations. All financial support schemes together represented more than 75% of all installations. And if we're looking at the installations that are relying on the pure competitiveness of PV installations, we are just talking about a few percent. And this is something very interesting that says that despite the rapid pace at which the PV market developed in the, in the last years, it remains extremely fragile because it's still policy driven. It's driven by policy regulations and it's driven by financial incentives that are decided at a political level. Now we have discussed about PV installations, uh, megawatts and gigawatts, but how much does it represent in terms of the percentage of the electricity demand that is covered by PV in a certain number of countries? And there, just have a look at the top of the bars. In three countries in the world, and these three countries are um, on the European continent, Greece, Italy, and Germany are producing more than 6%, and in the case of Italy, close to 8% of the electricity demand to SPV. And then we have more than 20 countries that are producing at least 1% of the electricity demand to SPV, some of them uh, between 2%, 3%, and 4%. And what is extremely interesting is that if we consider that PV, and that's the case, of course, is producing electricity only during the midday peak, then that peak consumption represents in general 50% of the electricity demand in a country. So we can multiply these numbers by two. And so the contribution of PV to the peak electricity demand in Italy, for instance, is close to 16%. It's uh, higher than 15% in Germany, 
um, it's higher than 15% in Greece. And that's extremely interesting to look at this in this way. I will not discuss too much um, about the other elements that you can see on the figure, but one, uh, one that is important is that the share of PV in the world electricity demand was at the end of 2014, just a bit more than 1%. So between 1% and the 16% or even higher scenarios that uh, some have put on the table, we have a long road between powering um, the world with um, PV energy. Before concluding, I would like to give you uh, some ideas about how PV became competitive in the last years. And something extremely interesting, and I think we should look at it more carefully, is what happened, what happened in the Middle East, and especially in Jordan and in Dubai. We had, and um, I, I could say that it's, this is happening as well in India for the time being, but we can see that PV applications are now sold with a levelized cost of electricity that is below or close to six US dollar cents per kilowatt hour. And this is done in the three cases that I've mentioned, in Dubai, in Jordan, and in India, without any financial support schemes. Of course, there are call for tenders be behind, and the money has to be paid by someone. But um, it means that with high irradiation, low cost of capital, low um, and the low um, cost of PV system that we can find on the market for the time being, it's possible to produce PV electricity below six US dollar cents per kilowatt hour. At six US dollar cents per kilowatt hour, there are not so many energy sources that can be competitive with PV. And even if coal, for instance, or hydro are still more competitive, I have no doubt that in the coming years, the cost of PV electricity is going to go down and most probably after 2020, or in the worst case, after 2030, we will see PV becoming the most competitive source of electricity in the world. I will not say anything about this. Uh, this is um, a figure that you can find in the, in the trends of PV application and that you can use for your PowerPoint presentations. Um, but it shows there are still many countries where PV can develop in the world. And I would like to conclude now. So I have said one word about the competitiveness of PV. PV is becoming competitive. It means that in the coming years, we will see more and more countries adopting PV because it's competitive in their electricity mix. It doesn't mean that financial support schemes are not needed, but it means that basically the cost of these support schemes will be extremely small compared to what we have seen in the past. Then in countries where with an electricity market, the question of the market integration will be extremely interesting. Um, this is something that's happening already in a certain number of European countries and in the US. PV is influencing the price on the market. And so what will be the market of the future that will be able to host extremely large shares of PV and wind electricity? That's a regulatory question that has to be solved uh, if we want PV to continue developing very fast. I have said a word about uh, financial incentives. Don't look in detail at uh, what is mentioned here. But for sure, self-consumption schemes have to be developed in order to ensure the, the development of the distributed PV market. I've mentioned previously that utility scale PV is developing very fast, but it's not the end of all things. And at certain moments, the integration of PV in the grid will have to be done through distributed PV. And then the question of business models is extremely important. And we have seen in the US and in some European countries, utilities or companies willing to compete directly with utilities, such as Solar City or Sunrun in the US, proposing innovative business models. I really think that we have to think uh, about innovation to ensure that the largest number of potential prosumers will be able to equip themselves with PV. And then, just to conclude, two last things, the question of quality and reliability, and I will repeat it all the time, is extremely important. It means qualified installers, good quality components, because PV is to produce during 20, 25, sometimes 30 years, and investors are willing to have a guaranteed um, income. And this has an impact on the cost of financing. 
uh, I was mentioning the Dubai uh, case where um, the LTOE reached by PV installation was below six US dollar cents per kilowatt hour. This has been achieved with a cost of depth around 4%. It's extremely low. And it means that to a certain extent, the confidence of investors is growing, but we shouldn't ruin the confidence of investors by installing low quality PV systems. So to a certain extent, everything is linked. And I would like to conclude by saying, some of you have already seen that, that I believe that PV will be the next step in the evolution of mankind. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gaten. Uh, my name is Izumi. Uh, as uh, Fernand introduced from now on, I'd like to give the uh, big picture of the global PB industry. Um, the, my presentation is based on the IAPBPS trends report issued in last October. The chapter four of the trends report debuts the status of the industry. So the most figures I give you are about 2014 status, but I would like to put uh, some of the uh, latest figures uh, as much as possible. The, my presentation, uh, here is my contents. Uh, mainly uh, three parts. The one is manufacturing activities in PBPS countries. Then uh, I'd like to focus on the uh, PB cell and module production and some technological points. Uh, trends report covers the overview of the uh, polysilicon manufacturing plus uh, other uh, inverter or BOS manufacturers. But due to the time limitation, uh, I just give the focus on the cell and module production. Then I'd like to uh, pick up some, some of the issues. OK. Um, this table shows the uh, very simplified value chain or manufacturing activities in the each PBPS member countries. And each country reports the industry status uh, in the national survey report, which you can uh, find in the PBPS website. So if you are interested in, in the uh, industry status of the specific country, so please visit the, our website. Then uh, you can see the uh, list of the national survey reports, and you can uh, reach the uh, more detailed information. So uh, now you can see the uh, besides China, uh, Germany, Japan, Korea, and the USA reported uh, many industry activities covering the uh, entire value chain uh, from polysilicon to the PB modules. Modules. Although the uh, production volume differs from the countries by country, the most of the PBPS countries reported module production. And the Torrens report also covers the non IEA PBPS countries, so that, that it describes some activities of the Taiwan or other countries as well. The next slide already uh, Gayton showed us the, uh, the 2014, the market slightly recovered. And then the, uh, in the last half of the 2014, the demand for the PB modules uh, had started to show increase. So the uh, manufacturers also started to increase production and manufacturing capacity. And uh, uh, in 
our analysis, the PB module production volume of the 2014 was uh, around 46 gigawatt. And in this year, 2015, the, because of the demand uh, increased to close around 50 gigawatt, uh, I think the uh, production volume may reach very close to 60 gigawatt. And next slide shows the uh, share of the PV module production and installation by country. The left chart shows the share of the production by country and uh, now you can see China produced more than 60% of the PV modules in 2014. The since 2013, the China is the largest supplier of the PV modules, plus the largest consumer of the PV modules. The, this is also the same as in 2015 and maybe in 2016 as well. The second country uh, contributed to the PV module production is Japan, my country. The Japan uh, produced almost 4.8 gigawatt in 2014. Then Korea and Malaysia followed. Now I'd like to talk uh, something about uh, technology. Uh, the warehouse-based crystalline silicon modules has been dominating in the global market. And uh, uh, crystalline silicon accounts for the more than 92% in 2014. The thin films share was only 8%. Because of the increased ca capacity of the production capacity, the speed of the pro enhancement of the production capacity was so fast, and the 2015 figure may see the slight decrease of the share of the stain films. The light chart shows the uh, share of the stain film technologies. The blue, blue bar shows the uh, cadmium telluride modules, and uh, among the Thin film technologies, uh, cadmium telluride accounts for almost 50%, uh, mainly from the one producer, I mean the first solar of USA. Uh, then the red bar uh, shows the thin film CIS, and the CIS is mainly uh, come from solar frontier of Japan, and some portion comes from Germany and USA manufacturers. The green part is the, uh, shows the share of the thin film silicon. The thin film silicon share has been decreasing. The one of the reasons behind this is the uh, product, <coughs> not the production capacity, but also um, efficiency of the PV modules. Uh, this chart. Uh, this is, chart is uh, thanks to the Dr. Arno Iega Waldau, uh, our task one expert member from EU. Uh, he summarized the evolution of the uh, cell and module efficiency of the crystalline silicon. Uh, in case of crystalline silicon, uh, in case of the <coughs> crystalline silicon, within two years, the module efficiency increased more than 4%. In case of crystalline silicon, uh, 5%. But if we compare the uh, status of the thin films, still uh, efficiency of the crystalline silicon uh, is better than those thin films. And among the thin films, the thin film silicons module efficiency remains relatively lower 
and uh, the, we haven't seen the uh, improvement uh, in these significant improvement in these years. And lower efficiency module requires more BOS, and that, that this is one of the reasons the film silicon has been losing the share. The, however, some of the uh, thin film silicon manufacturers try to enter building integrated market, or the technology of the thin film silicon is now applied to the uh, high efficiency solar cells like heterojunction silicon solar cell. But I think that this tendency will continue uh, this year as well. And uh, the, now I like to show the uh, status of the cell production. The cell production, the, uh, the status is almost the same as of the PB module production. But the one of the difference is uh, Taiwan has a, a share of the solar cell production. And now, uh, because of the uh, trade conflict, uh, some of the major players use uh, Taiwanese solar cells. And now I'd like to move on to the, some of the trends and issues. Uh, in 2014, the major companies started to announce production enhancement, forcing the growth of the PV market. And the, now uh, many of the PV companies, especially crystalline silicon companies, uh, establish more and more flexible production framework. Uh, this is the, to address cost reduction or local demand or the trade conflicts. And also the capacity enhancement was announced for higher efficiency solar cells. The next slide shows the uh, capacity enhancement plan uh, from uh, 2013 to 2015. The sum of the plan is not achieved, not yet, but to the most of the major companies uh, increase the plan to increase their manufacturing capacity. And uh, the next chart shows the uh, major manufacturer's production capacity of the uh, warehouse and cell and modules. The, the maybe uh, five years ago, the most of the company uh, tried to keep the uh, same manufacturing capacity of the solar cell and modules. But now, uh, due to the trade conflicts, there are more and more pressure on the cost reduction. Some companies procure warehouse from the specialized company or solar cells from outside of the companies. And the, this table uh, shows the uh, good example. Uh, this table comes from the uh, Chinese National Survey Report uh, produced by my colleague Lu Fang. Uh, I think uh, many people know uh, Torina Solar was the number one module company in 2014. Uh, they shipped 3.6 gigawatt of the PV modules in 2014. But if we look at the cell production, then Indy and JA, uh, they produced more than 3 gigawatt. So the, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this, is al this shows also the uh, production strategy of the each companies. And maybe uh, you are thinking about the 2015 ranking. And the, this table shows the uh, ship, PBB module shipment ranking in 2014. And the, uh, 
I listed up the shipment number of the uh, three quarters of the 2015. Uh, some company already shipped more, more than the previous year. And uh, the, according to the, their outlook, I don't want to uh, give the details, but uh, the, we will see the uh, change of the top 10 ranking companies uh, next in 2015 again. And this shows the uh, PB industry is not fully materialized. And uh, I think the consolidation will continue uh, as well. And uh, now uh, this is very complicated figures. The, I'd like to uh, talk another issue affecting the industry activities. The, uh, between some countries, uh, there was a conflict. And in some countries, the anti-dumping anti duties uh, required for in, in importing. So uh, because of this trade conflict, now uh, manufacturing basis of the PB module uh, is expanding in the many countries. The, this uh, world map shows the uh, new plans already uh, start <coughs> finished, con finished enhancement of the manufacturing capacity. Uh, the, for example, uh, India or Thailand will be the next uh, big manufacturing country in the future. And also, the uh, in the manufacturing capacity enhancement plans are adapted for higher efficiency. Uh, one of the example is park cells, and also the uh, four and five bus bus solar cells are adapted. And uh, many companies now are seeking to establish the uh, process line of the heterojunction solar cells. And also, bifacial solar cells with PARC technology is becoming popular. And because of the uh, PARC technology can increase uh, 0 0.7 to 1% 1, 1 of the efficiency, and uh, the adapting PARC technology is relatively uh, low cost for the uh, manufacturers. So park technology is now uh, getting common and common. And this slide uh, already shows in the uh, 2015 installed capacity is at least 551 gigawatt, according to Gaiton. The, uh, as I said, the 2015's production uh, may reach close to 60 gigawatt. But still, the, because of the uh, enhancement plan, the gaps between the uh, gaps between the demand and the capacity has not uh, now. And the, because of the over capacity, the many companies still have to overcome small margins, and the, they have to survive in the very competitive environment. And now I think the financing is the, uh, becoming very uh, complex. The, it's easy to get financing for the solar projects, but for manufacturers, especially the manufacturers with new technologies or startups, uh, it, sometimes it's very difficult to convince investors. The, if we see the recent IPO cases, the Sunland or Vivant Solar in US, they successfully uh, 
listed to the stock market. But to the, we can see only a few companies uh, succeeded IPO uh, from the manufacturing side. The, as far as I remember, the Solar Edge is the only manufacturer listed in NASDAQ in the in last year. But the growth of the PV market is coming or well, just started. So the uh, manufacturers have to differentiate pro their products to survive. The one way is uh, the get better performance or uh, obtain the reliability or give the added value to their product. Uh, now the PV plus storage batteries or the uh, BIPVs, uh, some companies seeking, and also the uh, companies have to differentiate customers plus business models. And now many uh, manufacturers go to the downstream. The equipment provider the, is becoming to be the energy provider. And uh, one of the exceptions, Solar City, the, the, this company uh, goes to upstream, uh, acquired the solar cell and module manufacture of the in US, Shirebo. So it remains to be seen that going upstream strategy is successful or not. But I'm very interested in the, uh, their uh, strategy uh, to establish gigawatt factory in the United States. The, this is the uh, last slide. Uh, this is also the work with Gaiton. The My conclusion is that the, we are sure the PV market is expected to grow uh, towards the 2020 Radar. And PV industry also should evolve and prepare for the growth and contribute to the to establishing healthy and sustainable PV industry in the future. Because now PV is becoming one of the major energy sources. Okay, thank you for your kind attention.